If you can't watch the full podcast, watch those cast clips to get the best in podcasting in our country. What the Shankaracharya actually explained to me and made me try to understand was that uh, you know the, the word linga in Sanskrit doesn't necessarily mean one of the several meanings uh, of it is uh, you know an organ, uh, the the sexual organ. But then other linga itself means a signifier. Lingyate iti lingam. Anything that signifies something is hmm. a linga. Or pulling stealing, we often say that. Yeah, it, it is a signifier of the uh, the, the the gender. So similarly, uh, the shivaling, when you say that this particular symbol is a signifier of Shiva, it doesn't necessarily mean it's his phallus uh, mm. that people are worshipping. So, uh, you know, when in South India, you have uh, names like Ramalingam and all of that, right? So he is a signifier. He embodies Rama. Uh, not so necessarily that he is the ling of Rama. Yeah. It's not like that. <laughs> yeah, it but is this, is such a, this is such a... Such a widely used yes. myth all across it, India and the world. Exactly. And that is the problem, Vinamra, that, you know, uh, those when we do not understand Sanskrit or any of the classical Indic languages, it could be Prakrit, Pali, Sen Tamil and all of that, and then try to access our texts. The, the, these could be, uh, you know, spiritual scriptures or it could be historical texts. In Sanskrit, every word has some 10 meanings depending on the context. So one really hmm. needs to have a scholar of Sanskrit working with a modern historian whose, I think, window to the past is just some 250 years, uh, all that we have with, uh, with this language that we are conversing in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, with English, there's just that much of our own past that we have access to. Uh, and translations most often lost in translation because not necessarily out of malice but out of ignorance of the language too uh, you know as a simple example like this linga uh, which could also mean this but also mean something else so in the book i also quote uh, you know various texts from the mahabharat to the manusmriti to where the same word linga actually means multiple things in different mm -hmm. contexts uh, and none of them actually refer to the sexual organ uh, so those who say phallus worship, some of the missionaries who wrote, they also spoke about Shiva worship being for fertility and so on. Mm. Uh, but I mention in the book that when we go and worship in a Shiva temple, that is not in our mind. Never. Women, yeah, women are not going there to uh, bear children. Uh, one of these uh, Peter Mundy or Tavania who came there, he says, yeah, maybe that is why most of the women who go there, uh, who are childless they go and pray to get children and maybe because he's the phallus that is why uh, they but get children this is also a very common myth i've i've also read this as india the land of phallus worshippers and <laughs> snake what? charmers and all of that right Isn't yeah it? so which is uh, which is not going on in our minds when we go to a uh, kashi vishwanath or any other shivling yeah. and do our uh, in Abhishek. fact there are demi gods for childbirth yes. in in small cities and rural yes. villages right yes. that don't have the same significance that shiva does Correct. where people go for the, those purposes Correct. yeah yeah so uh, so even in the linga there are uh, so different puranas have various uh, you know uh, meanings so it says the shivling itself is supposed to be one interpretation of it is three uh, you know there, there are dimensions that don't come to my mind readily now some amount of it is of uh, signifies brahma some part of it signifies vishnu and the topmost part is what represents shiva and mm. the brahma part is the one which is underneath that uh, you know the the argha that is okay. the the round oval uh, seat uh, some, uh, you know, the interpretation is that it is both, uh, you know, the the, yo the yoni or the womb uh, mm -hmm. of the Devi is the Argha and the Shivling uh, represents the man. Yeah, there's and a famous story, right, that you mentioned yes. about the, in the book. Yes, yeah. yes. And so this is like a 3D, uh, you know, uh, presentation of a 2D uh, image of an Ardhanarishwar where... Uh, you know, there's there's yin and yang in all of us, and our goal is to always get a balance of it. Uh, mm. And each of us, a man has a feminine aspect, a woman has a masculine aspect. And in uh, the Shankaracharya told me that even in wedding rituals, the idea is that that uh, you know the mantras that are chanted 
tell the bride and the bridegroom that we will try to complete each other that way that mm. i will get a little bit of the feminine of you and you as the bride get the masculine part uh, so the the indic vision has always been that these two should live in harmony and there should be a yin yang balance and so that's what we see in the ardhanarishwar half shiva half parvati and that in a 3d format is the shivalinga where the the base is uh, the feminine and the the structure above is the masculine so there are just so many interpretations and unless one gets into it and if you look at it in a very gross crass very superficial way uh, then i think it becomes very problematic so of course i must preface all this that this is completely outside the scope of my <laughs> specialization as a historian mm -hmm. but as i said this has been a new experience for me to delve into the uh, you can't explain sacred history without understanding the objects uh, right. you know which you are talking uh, you know the, the the sacrality of and as you mentioned in the abrahamic religions um, there's been no other religion other than those in uh, india where there's even a concept of a female uh, fe uh, divine feminine uh, mm. so the very concept that uh, god is a he uh, who's sitting in some uh, you know high skies all the time revengeful all the time seeing are you praying to me if you're not then i'm going to punish you here it's not so uh, there's a there's there's both man and woman and some say adi shakti she is more powerful than uh, than uh, the male gods that we have in the pantheon so for them the conceptualization itself that this doesn't necessarily mean the vulgarity of sex and secondly mm. sex itself was not considered vulgar in the mm -hmm. indian imagination as it was in the islamic or the victorian uh, you know era so uh, due to all these reasons i think our understanding of what shivalinga is what linga means what is even if there are sexual connotations by that is not a, a bad thing at all it's very much uh, a part of uh, it's the, it's the most important part of life and the reason for uh, the the generation of new life uh, and just as cremation and funerals are a part of life this is also a very important part of life which need not be shunned or looked down upon as something inferior something vulgar right uh, something that uh, you must know must be you, repressed and hidden away correct correct yeah. Se sex and even alternative sexualities everything i think the the broad embrace of uh, acceptance uh, in the indian context and it's so sad that we in india then don't today you know Mm -hmm. uh, uh you know uh, hark back to traditions and say even alternative sexualities are something that are deviant and unnatural whereas uh, everything is kosher in when it comes to the indian imagination in the past that's true if you like this clip i bet you will love the full podcast check it out on the doscast youtube channel